Hi, everybody. This is Photography of Director, and this is episode 11. I'm Vitaly Boxer, your host. And uh, today we'll be chatting with Eddie Rosenstein. He's a documentary filmmaker, and he's pretty fucking good and been doing it for a long time. So Eddie is a true filmmaker. He will go to the reaches that most people will not go to in order to succeed and to get his work done. For example, he went and became a miner in order to actually film the mining that is going on in uh, New York City, where they're building the whole water tunnel for the last 50 years. And no one else had access to this, but because he spent the time, the energy, and actually the months and months of work of actually becoming a union miner, they let him film that whole series that um, I believe it's on the History Channel. In either case, you should hear the whole story, so listen to the podcast and enjoy. Thank you. Okay, so uh, welcome to Photography of Director. We have Eddie Rosenstein. Is that correct? Do I say that right? Uh, yes, you pronounced Eddie correctly. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, did I pronounce your last name incorrectly? Because I never said your full name out loud. Wow, just in your dreams, huh? Yes, that's that's me. Okay, good, 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 good. So uh, you're already on. You're live, man. So you're a filmmaker, obviously, a documentary and reality filmmaker. And uh, you do a lot of shit, basically. And I worked with some of you on some stuff. That's why you're here. But on you, the shit. Actually. You do a lot of stuff. <laughs> you're lots of curse in this podcast, by the way. So... So tell us, uh, I, I want to actually introduce people differently because in, in the past I've introduced folks with just telling them about you, but I want to show one of your movies first before we get into you, okay? Yes. So this is one movie called Boat, Boat Lift, which I didn't work on, of course, sadly, uh, but <laughs> I guess you didn't invite me to this one. But Carlos Almonte, the, the guy I actually interviewed already, he cut this, this thing for you. And who was your narrator again? Tell us that. Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. And this story is about 9-11 and basically people being rescued by boats. So let me just play it and then we'll talk about it. I thought I was watching a movie, Towering Inferno at first. And then I looked real close and I noticed it was the World Trade Center. I was compelled because I'm a type of person that can't stand by and watch other people suffer. And to me, they were suffering. They wanted to get off the island and there was no way for them to get off the island other than the water. And I had noticed when I was watching the television, I saw a lot of, you know, the ferries going up into the slips and taking people off. I said, fine, we could do the same thing. I could take people on my boat, get in there, take them where they have to go. And that's what we did. On the morning of September 11th, when the towers came down, millions of people ran for safety. Hundreds of thousands of them ran south to the water's edge. That's when they realized that Manhattan is indeed an island and that they were trapped. That is a powerful film, and it actually has a, a ton of views. Like This was um, 7.2 million at this point. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, first, so now let's go back. I mean, tell us about you, because obviously you make serious stuff, and, and I know you do reality as well, but tell us about you, Eddie. Eddie the man. <laughs> Gosh, <Vitaly. laughs> um, I don't know. Eddie uh, the cross-dresser. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know what you want to know, but, um, you know, I think, uh, I think of myself as a documentary filmmaker. And um, which is like a summer job gone terribly wrong. You know, you get into this and you can't get out of it and you don't know exactly how you're going to pay your bills from it, but it's what you do and it's how you see the world. And, um, and uh, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't grow up in Brooklyn. Did you know that? I didn't I grew know up in that. Pittsburgh. I didn't know that. Yeah. And uh, this conversation is over. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and, and growing up, um, I didn't know any filmmakers. I didn't know there were such a thing uh, that documentaries existed, and uh, and I wanted to be a writer. And I wanted, but I I loved just watching people. And that was, you know, I used to have my mother like take me to the mall on like busy shopping days, like you know, President's Day or whatever it was, and just let me hang out there so I could just watch 
people and, and she would just like basically park me on a bench and I would just sort of just people watch or, or I would take the bus I would get the bus in front of my parents house and just just you know I, I would go all the way around the city and get off the bus in front of my parents house just so I could watch people and listen to conversations and maybe chat with people and like to dare myself to to like immerse myself into their lives or go into their neighborhood or whatever and um, I didn't know that there was a, a thing you could do that you could make documentary films and then I went to college and um, I sort of signed up for the film department by accident, which was hysterical. I, I, I was taking one of those bullshit classes, you know, Film 101, <laughs> literally called Film 101 in one of those <laughs> giant halls where you can watch movies and get college credit for it. I thought, that's, that's awesome. I should do that. And I loved it. I just totally loved it. And I went up to the professor and I said, are there more of these? And he said, yeah, you can major in this. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Really? And he said, yeah, I, I'm the head of the department. I could sign you up. And I said, my father is paying for school, and he'll never pay for it if I study film. Um, I have to do something more practical than that. And my father had me studying you know, business as a major with writing as a minor. So that, that was like our deal. So he'd pay for school. It was like, you know, it's got to justify the, 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 you know. So I, we go up to this guy's office. And he says, yeah, I'll, I'll call your father and I'll, I'll talk to him. I said, okay, <laughs> let's do this. So we, we walk up the hill to his office and he calls my father and he, he's, he's going to, you know, and my father, of course, says, so will my son get a job? And this guy, his name was Bill Uricchio, and he goes, puts his hand over the receiver and he says, are you willing to drive a cab? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he goes, yes, sir, he'll always work. <laughs> and that was it. I transferred to the film department, and there was a documentary oh, teacher there who I just couldn't believe that you could actually just go into people's lives and and shoot it and tell their story, and you could call that a job. And that was it. I was hooked. That's uh, that's a pretty fucking amazing story. <laughs> I didn't even want to interrupt you to say, like, in the beginning when you were young, and you're staring at people, you could have gone the Dexter route or you could have gone the yep. filmmaking route. <laughs> no, I know. It's amazing I wasn't arrested for this, but um, I kept my pants on. <laughs> it was an innocent time. <laughs> Imagine now some fucking weirdo sitting at a bench staring at people. <laughs> that's, that's the future of our art form. Yes. <laughs> that's pretty cool. I didn't know this about you. Awesome story. So uh, you're not driving a cab right now, obviously, right? No, you know, it's funny. I've only worked in film my whole life. And that was a long time ago. And you want to hear the other funny part about that story was uh, I had a woman working for me as an intern for a while, and then she was going to go back to – actually, she wasn't even an intern. She, was, she, was a, she worked for us, and she was going back to school. So she was going to school um, at MIT. She was applying to this program, and she asked me to write this recommendation for her. And I had lost touch with this guy, this Bill Uricchio guy, a long time <laughs> earlier. And – uh, I, so I said, sure, I'd love to write your recommendation. Thank you for asking. And I write it. I said, who do I write it to? And she said, well, the head of the department is this guy, Bill Uricchio. <laughs> so I said, oh, my goodness. He, I, I, it's amazing. So I write her recommendation at the bottom. I write, um, by the way, I recount this story. I said, you probably don't remember this, but I got into film because of you, and it's been a wonderful career since. I just want to thank you. But said, what a crazy day that was. And he called back immediately. He said, oh, my God, I've always wondered what happened to you. <laughs> I'm so glad it worked out. <laughs> He's like, you're not driving a cab, right? <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. He turned to you and actually said that. That's uh... <laughs> <laughs> because, like, it is hard in film, you know. But, but the thing is, in, even though it's hard, I think people who – excel at their job always find some sort of way to make a living at it at least that's what i've noticed that people who are good at what they do well there's a lot of people that are good at what they do that you know part of this is marketing and getting yourself out there um and uh you know documentary filmmaking is you know there's there's art and there's commerce and sometimes that's art and it doesn't mean necessarily that people want to see it or will pay money to see it or that there's an avenue to see it. You know, I hope we get to talking about School Play, which is a great example of a film I love. But it doesn't necessarily have a documentary niche. You know, it's not an issue film. It's a, it's a nonfiction story. It's a hero's tale told in very small pieces. And, 
And I love it because it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a very intimate journey with, with people. It makes you laugh and it makes you cry. And it was a story that we wanted to tell because we didn't want to always have to make films about, you know, lesbian crack dealing Holocaust survivors, you know, who climb Mount Everest with one leg, you know, it doesn't always have to have issues. And the genre I find always the best. (laughs) Those are the films I typically do watch, but you know, it's, um, we got tired of having to make films that were fundable and we wanted to make a film just about things that we love, you know, the kind of thing that you see next door and you say they're, they're wonderful people. And it's a wonderful story. It's the kind of thing that brings you a lot of joy. But it isn't necessarily a big film. And those are hard films to make and those are hard films to sell because unfortunately people don't necessarily understand that documentary films can just be beautiful stories from life and don't have to hit you over the head like a baby seal to, to bring you some issue that you didn't know about. They don't have to be spinach. They can be just beautiful stories. So we don't get a chance to tell those often enough. And they're very difficult to market or make money out of. So, I mean, we're going to talk about that film. but. Basically, how do you find your projects? I mean, this reason, where do you, you find them, right? You actually go in, in seeking them. Well, <clears throat> sometimes, but um, that means you have to raise money, and I'm not that great at that. I could tell you right away I'm pretty bad at raising money. So I, I, I'm always looking for life in three-act structure. I'm always looking for the projects that I care about. And then I'm also always looking for how to feed my family and, and earn a living at this. So I do a lot of television, which I also really enjoy. Um, and I, I pay my bills as well as I can. And every once in a while, I get ahead, and I, I, I go and I bet it all on another film, another horse, <laughs> another horse, and uh, and sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. And um, but you know, sometimes I just get really passionate about a topic, and then all bets are off. You know, I'll just I just keep driving until I go over the cliff because I can't help it. So let's go back a little bit. I I showed them boat lift just so we can discuss that. Tell us about how that came together and what is it about and and why did you do that one? Well, that one's a short film. It's only ten minutes, and it was we that was a commission. Um, there was an organization that was uh, some of these really great guys who had a think tank in Washington, and they asked um, the White House who's doing the ten year anniversary of nine eleven, and they said, well. <laughs> You are. And uh, they said, great, we're in. And they decided to do it as a, um, as a short film festival. So participants did three of the films, and we did two of them. And they did five short films. Over the course of a day, they showed short films at this huge venue in Washington, D.C. And they were all supposed to discuss um, resilience, really, because what this think tank, they were... Um, committed to is, is the idea that we need to all be prepared in the event of a disaster in, in ways that we're really not. I mean, for 10 years after 9-11, the government put out orange alerts and said, if there's a problem, if you see something, say something. And right, They right. just ignored the fact that America really needed to be ready and really did handle themselves very well. People handled themselves very well after 9-11. So they wanted stories that told that, um, that tale and that they, they wanted a way to demonstrate the ways that we are handling adversity and that we can commit ourselves to doing an even better job in the future. So we got two films to make, and uh, they're both nice. But this one caught fire in the Internet and uh, has actually, like I think, about 10 million views in various places. And it's uh, this really it's what, what we all like to do, you know, you included, which is make the familiar unfamiliar and make the unfamiliar right. familiar. So this is... 9-11 has, is a story that we've all heard so often, but what if you just turn the cameras the other way? Everybody was pointing the cameras at the pile and the dust and, and, and the carnage. And what about the heroes of the day? What about the people who, who did the best they could? Um, and so this is the story of the people who rescued so many others. Well, I like and, that you found, uh, this is a story, I mean, I was there in 9-11 in a building on 59th Street or so. And I didn't even know that there was guys on boats rescuing people. Yeah. This is not something that's was widely told, basically. Yeah. So uh, how, really how was this story? Cool. How was that story found? Um, one of the guys who organized uh, the event um, is uh, Steve Flynn, um, was in the Coast Guard for most of his career and uh, was familiar with that story. And 
when he was telling us what were the stories that um, some of the films, some of the concepts he was thinking about for this festival, this short film festival, that one hit me right between the eyes. It was everything. And, uh, and as we looked into it, the story just kept getting better and better. And so we throw our hearts behind it. And, and as the ball started rolling, you started shooting. When did Tom Hanks become involved? And how the hell did you get him on a short film? I mean, I like, I'm sure well, he's not like dying to do short films, right? <laughs> 10-year anniversary. And uh, so it was, it was, he was supposed to be the, narr- the MC of the event. And Obama was supposed to present that film. And it was a big deal. And, but then he couldn't make it. And so he said, well, how can I help? And by then, we were all passionate about Boat Lift and, and the other film we were making as well. And so um, the organization throwing the event said, well, would you mind calling Eddie and narrating those two films that he's doing? And he said, sure. And uh, he was wonderful. You know, he, he volunteered his time. That's nice. How, how, was, it, how was it directing uh, one of the biggest actors <laughs> of all time? You know, like this, when he... he uh, when he, you know, I was, I was sort of, I'm watching your face as you were playing this thing. And so Tom Hanks showed up and he'd, he'd read the script and he'd actually memorized it and he showed up early and he was great. And, and, uh, but then I'm, he, he's listening to the, he's watching the piece and I'm waiting for his reaction. And, uh, it was a real honor when it finished and he goes, that is a marvelous piece of film. And I was like, I wrote that down. I was so honored. You know? Did you was, record it? <laughs> actually, it is probably, but I don't know. Um, Should be your anyways, ringtone. It was very nice. And he was, he was a really generous guy. And, and, and take after take, this and the other thing, it's, it, the nuance that uh, he brings is unbelievable. He, he can, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, a gymnast with his abilities. He can just contort and, and pull things out of, his, his emotional range and uh, it's unbelievable so he was he was really going off on this um, wonderful versions of this thing and then I said to him I said can you just be Tom Hanks and he said yeah or I could do that <laughs> stop acting please <laughs> yeah but he, he's, he's wonderful all right that was cool but uh let's take it back uh, let's take it back we sort of skipped my fault but we skipped what was your first job? So you graduated from film program, right? Oh, yeah. Documentary filmmaking is that, is that was the program. How did you no, get it? Was just, it was just film. Yeah. Okay, film program. How did you get into the world, and what did you start well, I went doing? To Penn State, and then I uh, I got a, a job as an intern off of a bulletin board at Penn State. They hired me to uh, um, come for the summer, and uh, and I, I came up, and. You know, it was, uh, I literally had, you know, I, I'd come one night on a ro- drunken road trip. The bars closed in, at, in State College, and we thought, well, where can we still get a drink? And so we just drove to New York. I'd never been to New York before. And the sun came up, and we were sitting at this bar in, in uh, on, it's called the Riviera. You probably know it, right? It's uh, this place Sounds down there, like a village. Yeah. And at the corner... And as the sun came up and I saw everybody milling around and starting to go to work and it was like right off Christopher Street. So, see, you know, the, like people coming home doing walk of shame and, and like <laughs> transvestites and, and, uh, and, and business people. And it's just like everybody was going out as a professional. Like I love people and I looked at this world and it was just pulsing. And it was like 24 hours and I thought... I'm going to be in New York for the rest of my life. So we, we were only there for a few hours. But when I finished college, um, that uh, you know, I, I went back. I applied for this internship, and they took me. And uh, and and I was like, that's amazing. So I came up for the summer, but I I had like twelve cents, and um, you know, they were it was like basically an unpaid internship, you know. So uh, and um, so it, I was just working twenty four hours a day, and they thought, well, this guy was willing to do anything <laughs> but if you worked after 10 o'clock at night they would buy you a sandwich or whatever it was you would eat right. so it was like the only way i was going to get a bite to eat so i was just working non-stop so um i go back to school and it was time for my senior film class and the guy in senior film he uh he saw the project i wanted to do and it's kind of this experimental thing and he told me that it was too experimental and too much of a student film and i wasn't welcome to take senior film 
So they basically threw me out of school. What? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, wow. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> That's awesome because this place will hire me. So I went back and I went to work for this place. And I was like, wow, this is great. And it was like a, they did corporate films and some commercials and things like that. And they needed a PA. So they were willing to give me a job. The only problem was it, the job didn't pay enough that I could actually live. So, <laughs> um, so what I did was for like three months, I would work later than anybody else was after everybody left. And then I would sleep on the couch and I'd get up at like four or five in the morning. Oh, so you had, you had no home. I was homeless. You were also, okay, you're the, my second homeless guest. <laughs> 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 so I, did this. I showered there. I kept my clothes under the desk. And I worked there nonstop for like three, four months. And they just kept giving me more stuff to do. So then I was editing their stuff and I was producing. By the time I, my 21st birthday rolled around, I was a producer there. And I'd gotten raises. And I was on my way. That's, that's amazing. I'm glad I asked because like you did what most people won't do is give up everything. I didn't have much to give up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I like you—you you gave up a, a place, a bed. Do you know what I mean? Like you gave up a bed, you gave up a home, you gave up uh, possibly a girlfriend during that time. I don't know if you could yeah, even. Yeah, actually, I did. Like yeah. I can't imagine you. Uh, welcome to my home. No, it it looks like an office. Like, <laughs> it's all I wanted to do. It was. It was great. I mean, you're in your, you know, you're young and dumb. You right. Know, right. Uh, for me, it was like, wow. Yeah. They're yeah. gonna pay me to do this and <laughs> feed me. This is the right. And give me a couch. <laughs> I mean, a place to sleep for a few hours. It's amazing. But they they never found out that I was sleeping. That's amazing. Was that really was for tough. three months too, right? This wasn't like a. Yeah. No, it was for months. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so let's go back. I want to let's take us back to the IMD page because I want people to see uh, the body of work, as I like to call it. And uh, you have a lot of documentaries. We already talked a little bit about Boat Lift, and then there's a documentary called Sand Hogs. Tell us a bit what it's about before I go into it. The, um, New York would not exist if it weren't for the tunnels, right? And, uh, you know, everybody knows I, I love the subways for all the reasons we've just mentioned. The other thing I used to do for entertainment back in the beginning days of New York is I'd just go on the train and ride around, and oh, I loved it. Um, but New York wouldn't exist without these tunnels. But I'm from western Pennsylvania, which is a mining kind of place. And um, when I found out that there's still people digging tunnels and there's miners and mining camps in New York City, I read like articles about this over the years that we hear the sand dogs mentioned. And I thought, what is going on? And eventually, a um, friend of mine, I just finished a project, said, so what's the one project you'd like to do now that you're done with everything? And I said, I want to do something on the sand dogs. I started to tell her the story that I didn't even know I'd been accumulating this information over the years. And it was the story of these urban miners, these mythical creatures in my mind who... <laughs> And, uh, we're digging still these tunnels and I'd heard tell of the big one the project that was uh, apparently the largest public works project in the history of the Western Hemisphere and it was going on right underneath everybody's feet in Manhattan they were digging the new water tunnel that if they weren't successful in digging the newest the second water tunnel that the city could perish and I just I've been piecing together pieces of this story for years. Just in, you know, you read about the Times or the Post and little pieces of this. But in fact, it was true that all of our water in New York City comes from 100 miles north. We don't have any water here. And this is the biggest city in America times two. There's next biggest city in the country is Los Angeles. There's only three and a half million people there. I mean, in this very relatively small geographic place, you've got millions and millions of people drinking billions of gallons of water that we couldn't exist without it. The hospitals couldn't run, you couldn't flush a toilet, you know. Uh, you'd have to empty the city entirely, but all of our water comes from one giant tunnel that was condemned in 1954. Wait, what do you and mean? It's, were, it's functioning still, right? Condemned, but It is still... functioning, but they, were, they tried to shut it off to do some repairs, and the valve to dewater the tunnel just flat out broke off. There's no way to fix the tunnel. Okay. So the city is hanging on by a thread for a half century. How is this not a huge story in, in New well, York? This is the thing. This is one of those as a documentary filmmaker, you go, what are we going to do? 
how are we going to tell this story? Well, the thing about this is, is it was at the time, because the second water tunnel was still being dug and was 40 years into its construction when I started trying to do this. They'd been working on this since the 70s. And they still have like 10, 15 years, right? Well, they're actually done now. I did this. They finished. Um, but I caught them at the tail end of it. And um, Bloomberg threw men at it and said, let's finish this tunnel. Are you kidding me? Because if there's an earthquake and that tunnel collapses, they'll have to empty out the city. No one can live here for a few years. <laughs> it's the end of the American economy. It makes Katrina look like nothing. Right. So I heard this story and I said, I've got to get into this tunnel. Somebody's got to tell this story. Well, I'm not the first one to have come up with that idea. <laughs> Every documentary filmmaker who'd ever heard of this said, we got to get into the tunnels. But nobody ever got into the tunnels because the guys who dig the tunnels, they call them the sand hogs. They're union miners, local 147. And they don't take to strangers in the tunnels. The only people in those tunnels are tunnel workers, the sand hogs. And so I said to them, can I make this? You know, do your story, and they said, go talk to the city. And the city says, go talk to the Sandhogs. And they keep doing this back and forth. And that goes on for a couple of years. So most people said, okay, this is ridiculous, and they walked away. Then one time, the mayor saw a film I'd worked on. I worked. I spent a few years following low-wage workers for this thing called Waging a Living. And the mayor liked the film, and the filmmaker who hired me, the, the executive producer, um, had connections. So anyways, the mayor said to the sand dogs, yeah, let the guy do this. So <laughs> now they didn't know what to do. They couldn't put me off for that much longer. So they said, you know, no one, none of those guys will ever trust you, you know. So I, I did the only thing I thought I could do, which is I just started showing up and um, trying to earn their trust by becoming a union miner. So so uh, this is this is the part that's crazy. It, they still didn't let you in the tunnel, so you had to wait until you were allowed by becoming a union miner. Well, you can't become a union miner, but you can what it's called shaping. You wait and try to get a day's work by somebody else doesn't show up. They're on vacation, they're sick, they're injured. So I, I went for I don't remember how long, a couple months. Every like day. Every, every day, like five in the morning. And I'd go to the, called the hog house, at the <laughs> water tunnel, this construction trailer. And uh, I'd stand there with all the other ex-convicts and cousins and nephews and people who were all more likely than me, a Jewish middle-aged documentary filmmaker, <laughs> to um, be able to do uh, a day's work as a minor and have the opportunity to get a day. Uh, the union knew who I was, but they didn't want the rest of the guys to know who I was. So they just said, go and earn a day, make friends, do whatever you do. But whatever you do, probably don't talk a lot. Because guys <laughs> like you, they don't show up to, to work here. So just keep your mouth shut, and uh, maybe you'll get a day. So after a few months, finally, uh, a guy came up to me and whispered in my ear, and he said, change your clothes. And I was going down. So, uh, I mean, I want you to finish this, but why did they decide after? I mean, obviously, there was a decision internally that they talked about. This fucking Jew is here waiting yes. every day for yep. four months. Yep. That must they, have been what They happened. wanted me to earn it. And they wanted everybody there to feel that I'd done it, that they didn't hand it to me because they couldn't just hand it to me because those guys, you know, they're, you're in a place where you could be 20 miles in a tunnel, 800 feet down, 20 miles in. And something could go wrong, a collapse, a cave-in, a derailed train. Just everything's big and heavy and, and can cause severe damage. And if something does go wrong, it's not like you're calling an ambulance. Nobody's coming to uh, do anything to help you. The only person down there is going to help you is a, is a union brother, a sand hog. And um, so they're pretty picky about who's in those tunnels because things do go wrong, you know, mm -hmm. frequently. They say that... They typically lose a man a mile. For every mile of tunnel they make, they, they, another guy dies. And this is for real. And I've seen terrible accidents. And um, so they, you got to earn your trust. There's, there's nothing they can do. They can't mandate it. you got to earn it. So eventually the, I get a day, and they put me at the bottom of the tunnel. And I'm going to, it's called mucking out the sump, you know? So you're at the sump pump, which is the lowest part of the tunnel where all the gravel and dust and water is going to, get pumped out in case you shut it down. That's where water will come to. And I'm underneath a conveyor belt, and I'm just going to have to shovel this rock 
the wet rock dust. The only reason I got this job is the guy who had been doing it before me, strong as a bull 18-year-old, had got his head cut in a conveyor belt, and he wasn't coming back to work anytime soon. In fact, he never came back to work. And so they said, let him do that. So I shovel for about eight hours straight, so my hands are bleeding, my back is breaking, and I'm a total mess, but I just will not put down that shovel. And because uh, I've waited months for this opportunity. And so I, I don't even remember going home. I was in so much pain. <laughs> and, uh, and I came back the next morning. They never thought they'd see me again. And I came back the next morning and waited. And thank God they didn't. Thank God they didn't call you? That day. <laughs> I could not have made it to the elevator shaft. But um, so eventually, a few weeks later, um, I was working full time on a gang in what they call shaft, which is the holes where the water is going to come up and you're going to dynamite it down. So you're, you're, you're over like a six or 800 foot hole that they've bored up and you're going to dynamite the lips of that to widen it. And that's going to be the hole where the water is going to come to the street level. It's just crazy scary working in a shaft. It's just any, any wrong move, you fall 600 feet straight down. Um, you're walking over like two by twelves, carrying sixty pound wrenches, and it's all wet and slimy and, and dirty. And you're dynamiting your way down every night. The first night I worked in the in the shaft, I came home. I was so freaked out from the night's work that I just literally just sat up all night, just kind of shaking in terror, um, and drinking you know Maker's Mark and, and trying to calm down. And I went back the next night, and I got another night. And about a week later, I, I could handle it. And then they said, he's here, you know, put him in the union. And um, I actually got a permanent spot on that gang. So I worked the 3 to 11 shift as a sand hog, and I'd make films in the morning. And then I'd go and I'd work dynamiting my way into uh, the so, city. So you didn't become evening. a cabbie, you became a miner. I became a miner. <laughs> and eventually they said, bring a camera, Eddie, with a thick Irish accent. And I took a camera in, finally. I was allowed to bring in a camera. Wait, so how, uh, how many months have you, now you're working there. How many, how long were you working there before they said, fine, you can take a camera down? Uh, from the time I started shaping till they let me bring a camera, it's probably about six months. Wow. And um, so I, I probably had uh, two and a half months of days working. Um, before I bring a camera. So I finally brought a camera down. That's a long story. We got arrested on the first night I had a camera because you're not allowed to film in these highly We want to we hear the story. That's the That's story. That's a crazy story. <laughs> That's the story we want to hear. I mean, I haven't even shown the trailer, but <laughs> go, go ahead. Tell us um, the story. Morgan Curran, who you'll see if you ever watch the film, and it's actually on YouTube. I put the whole 90-minute film that I eventually made for History Channel. Um, Morgan Curran was my boss, and... And uh, he was the walking boss of that, that shift. And he's the one who made me a full-time sand dog on his gang. And, uh, and Mo Morgan's the best. Um, the best blaster. The be he's an artist with dynamite. Like, you, you can't believe it. I could go on about that for a day. What this guy can do with dynamite is shocking and brilliant. And, and um, who knows where he learned how to do this, in the IRA or something. <laughs> you know? And so, uh, so he, he, but he's also a maniac full-blown, beyond doubt maniac, um, known to drink a little bit. And uh, so he, he's the one who says, bring a camera, Eddie, bring a camera. And I said, Morgan, if I bring a camera, we call it shooting, you know, drilling and shooting. So you're just going to be shooting at night. We're going to take out 12 feet of prehistoric granite out of the, uh, out of the earth. And I said, but if, if I'm shooting with this camera, it means you're down a guy for, you know, for your shot. And so you guys, uh, you're down a worker. He says, nah, it's going to be a big one tonight, Eddie. It was 2,000 pounds of dynamite we were going to pack into the earth. And we're gonna, it was going to be a huge, huge explosion. It was going to be great. He says, bring a camera tonight. So I take in the camera. And I know you're not allowed to film dynamite in the city. because, And I know you're not allowed to film in the water tunnel. It's all very... You know, this is national security. This is, um, if the water tunnel goes down in New York City, it's, it's a problem. America could possibly not recover from this for a long time financially. It's all very highly secure. You're not allowed to film dynamite. You're not allowed to film dynamite trucks. You're not allowed to film in the water tunnel. I knew all this, 
But I'm in the tunnel, so I'm just in my glory now. I'm with my friends. I'm on the gang. We're filming. It's going to be a big shot. And then the crane sticks, sends down this big bird cage to take you out when you're going to actually detonate the explosion. And um, so the bird cage is coming up, and I'm filming as we rise up above, and we're now back street level and the natural light and... You know, it's just this beautiful shot and these big guys with hands like oven mitts and everybody's, you can't even tell who the white guys are, the black guys now, because we've been blowing out holes with compressed air and the oil and the muck is on everybody. And, and there's miners and we're like across the street from Lincoln Center, <clears throat> you know, and we're going to come up and we're going to blast this now. Always the highlight of the evening. And so the, um, as the, as the birdcage rises above street level, the safety guy from the yard sees the camera. What's that? I was like, oh, God, I totally got lost in the moment. And I'm like, nah, nothing, nothing, nothing. I put the camera into my lunch pail, and, and uh, we go, and, you know, you hear the horns, and then the blast, and the wave, the windows all up on the Upper West Side go like this. They look like liquid. It's amazing. So I'm not shooting that because I'm realizing, oh, we just got busted with a camera. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then we take our lunch break and we have to go down and start to muck it out, get the debris down, let it drop down the hole. So I go back down in to the hole after lunch. And then if somebody screams down from the top, hey, Rosenstein, come on up. We're sitting in the cage. It's weird to hear your name. It sounds very Jewish in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> and they're sending the cage for me. <laughs> so I, I come back out of the tunnel and uh, what's going on? And I see Morgan, who I had seen like 20 minutes earlier, but now Morgan's drunk as a skunk. He's just <laughs> drank like two six-packs of his Coronas from the Dwayne Reed across the street. And, and, um, and I'm like, what is going on? He goes, you got to go talk to the man, Eddie. So I go into the construction trailer where the, the bosses, you know, the project managers are. And he says, yeah, you, you're a Santog? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm a Santog. And he goes, because I've been in the union now for like, a week or something, you know, whatever. <laughs> since they gave me my actual my union card, my book. And um, he says, yeah, 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 yeah. My grandfather's a Sandhog. My father's a Sandhog. But, you know, you know, I hate to say it. You know, shouldn't have had a camera. Now they got to arrest you. And I'm like, what do you mean they have to arrest me? He said, well, you know, it's FEMA and everybody. And I said, yeah, you can't do that. You know that. It's too bad. <laughs> it's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh well that is a problem so i said you know um the uh um the the name of the organization that was uh running the tunnel was the uh um department of environmental protection of the city the dep of the mm -hmm. city nyc so i said uh do you have do you have emily lloyd's number can you call emily lloyd <laughs> yeah yeah call emily lloyd I said, no, no, you can call her. She, 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 she told me I could, you know. So as it turns out, like a year before, I had been petitioning the city to do this project. So she knew I existed. She just didn't know I'd become a miner. <laughs> so I said, yeah, no, call her. I, I have her number. And it, so anyways, I actually had her cell phone number. So I call her and she's at home and she's having dinner. It's like 7 o'clock at night. <laughs> and I explained. I said, you know, remember I was going to do that film? I've since become a miner. And she said, you're kidding. And I said, no. And I said, D did you hear about the guy with the camera tonight? And she says, that's you? I said, yeah. <laughs> she said, don't worry about it then. And so they didn't arrest me. And they let me keep the footage. And I go back and I said to Morgan, who now has had like another two six packs. He's <laughs> obliterated. <laughs> and I tell him that um, it's okay. And he says, you're connected, Eddie. I said, you thought I was really a minor? I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> this is why I'm here. I told you that. But he was, by now I'm just working on the gang. And he totally forgot about it. And as it turns out, the reason he drank so much is this is the Santogs. And I learned the biggest story possible is that when they came and they said, what's going on? Morgan Curran said, I told him to take a camera because he's my boss. And Sandhogs protect Sandhogs. But Morgan Curran had never really finished his immigration status and maybe had a couple of violations along the way and bumps on the road. And so when Morgan said that I told him to take a camera, 
he thought we were getting arrested that night, which for Morgan meant that he was going to wake up in Dublin <laughs> and he was getting deported. But he was still trying to take the fall from me because he wouldn't, as my fellow union member and my walking boss, he would never let me take the fall for him. So when it turned out that I got us out of trouble, I'd also saved Morgan Curran. Mm. And I didn't even know that. And then the party began. <laughs> we all hit the bar for the rest of the night. No more work got done. And after that, making the film was easy because they were my lighting crew and they'd rig lights just to shoot it and they would bring cameras and we, we oh, would really? do a special thing. It, it, it was together we were going to make this project. We would rig we would rig dollies with you know with little trains and yeah. By then we were all making the film because now I was I was in the union. All right. Well, we've pu we've pumped up this movie. Yeah. <laughs> now now let me show like a trailer that I have. Uh, I don't know if this is the best representation, but I sent you. I you sent it, but anyways. Yeah. Let, let me show this. If uh, worst case, I'll, I'll I'll put up you know the the better version that you send me later on. So let's watch it. This isn't Disney World. If you're soft skin, you're not going to cut it here. Mile a man. Every mile of tunnel we do, we lose a man. Camaraderie that you have here is unbelievable. Everything can happen here down here. What do we got to die to make a living here? So, that was the promo for after History Channel figured out what well, I shot that night, and then I sold uh, uh, what was going to be History Channel's first theatrical release. And then they said, well, can you make this into a series? And so we did not just a 90-minute film, which was the pilot for the series. It became another 11-hour series called Sand Hot. So, so how, we did 13 hours for history. How long were you there in the mine? Well, <laughs> so, well, I, well, when I they thought, hired you, hold on, when they hired you to, film, to basically, yeah, you're the filmmaker here. You're the miner. <laughs> you, yeah, no, I continued to do shifts and shoot. Um, until we got the whole thing going on, and then, and then I was. You had a two jobs. Filmmaker. You had two jobs. I had two jobs. I was a miner at night and a filmmaker in the day, and then by the time History Channel commissioned the full two-hour film, then I was just a filmmaker, and then I was filming just mainly the story of the water tunnel, and then the eleven-hour series. Then I had by then I could take cameras everywhere. The city we wired the whole system, and I could film blasting. I could film any tunnel in the city. They were starting the seven line extension, building the subway out over that way. They were bringing the east side access, which is this crazy project, bringing Long Island Railroad into Grand Central and building a cavern under Grand Central. So we did all of these beautiful projects and these huge, huge, huge projects. And so by then I had plenty of help. We had crews working 24 hours a day in the tunnels. Without you doing all those things for months on end, all alone, with no support, nobody there except you, 5 o'clock every morning, trying to get in and film these guys in the mines, it would never have happened at all. Um, correct. No, nobody had been able to tell their story. Nobody had been given permission or access to those tunnels. And as a filmmaker, you know, it doesn't burn any filmmaker knew that this is a big story. The state of the city, maybe the country, depends on it. Biggest public works project in the history of the Western Hemisphere happening secretly, almost quietly, underneath millions of people's feet, literally. Crazy pieces of technology, wild characters. It's a big story. So how do you get access? And that's, um, I think, there. there's two things I take from this story that, one is one of the great joys of being a documentary filmmaker, which is not the big paycheck. One of the great joys is a chance to have this adventure and to go into worlds that you find um, wonderful, to be with people you find heroic, to tell their story, to become a part of it. And I've always been an immersive documentary filmmaker, whether it's spending a year in drug rehabs and crack houses in Harlem or moving into a Jewish senior citizen community in Florida or Wherever, I enjoy going the distance and becoming part of worlds and immersing myself. Um, that's part of the, the reason why documentary filmmaking is so addictive and wonderful. But the other thing is, and this is what I, I, I always try to stress when I'm teaching, is that you have to sell your work. And to sell your work, you need unique access to a big story. Just having an idea, like, it's a story of traveling. And you know, it's like, 
that doesn't have value. But if you have access to something and no one else has access to it, then that has some marketability. So in order to make a living at this, you need to get the unique access to great characters into the big stories, which is why for that one, it was worth going the distance. Right. But I mean, the big point to take away is also, you didn't, did you know that you were going to get the story? Like, is that something you just knew or this was a big risk? You know, like you, you, they're all big risks, Vitaly. You know this. You don't go into this as a business unless you have a high risk tolerance. I never knew that it would be a big story. I never knew that I would sell it. I never knew that I would ever get it. It was a big risk, and I never knew if it would work out. But you know, I think if you're willing to accept no, then you probably shouldn't be doing this for a living. Um, not to say you can't respect no, but. The more that they kept saying I couldn't do this, the more I saw it as a challenge that I wanted to do it. And, um, and that there must be something really incredible in that hole or they would, they would have said yes a long time ago. So it was like waving a red flag in front of a bull saying that you're not allowed to do this. And I was like, oh, yes, I am going to do that. So that was a, just a motivator, really. So what is actually that most inc- what what incredible thing did you find out in that hole? Was it the people? Was it the actual hole? Was it the building of the future? What what was it? It's all of that. It's um it's the brotherhood. It's uh, the hard work. Um, as we said, I haven't ever really done many jobs besides working in film. Um, but there's something about most people's lives that have no nothing concrete, literally, that you're doing. And um, there's something just incredibly beautiful and empowering about when you're mining, you're going that way. Your job is to go that way every day. You need to go 10 feet, 12 feet that way. And um, I just love when life is just that pure. You know, we never quite know what our role is or what we've done at the end of the day. They know what they did at the end of the day. They went 12 feet. (laughs) <laughs> feet, six feet, 20 feet. I know what they did. A good so day, 20 feet. <laughs> a good day is 20 feet. Yeah. Uh, and they're, de- they're dealing with everything in footage. You know, that's what we deal with, how much footage we've accumulated. And that's what they deal with as well. But, you know, there's just a, uh, you work hard. And at the end of the day, you know what you did. And uh, that's a good day. You know, you come out safe. Well, it was something very pure. It's also cool that basically you said they've been building this for 40 years, so some of those people have started and will die in that tunnel. Yeah, yeah, and fathers and sons. And fathers and sons, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So th- that's, that's uh, uh, what was the name of the, the documentary again? It's called Sandhogs. You Sandhog. can watch the whole two hour, the 90 minute thing, uh, the, the original, the pilot, about the one that I really spend a lot more time working on um, on YouTube. And then the whole series is downloadable on iTunes, which is uh, is then the reality series version of it, which is pretty cool. What's the last one that you're working on, which is actually an interesting story, but also a passion project? Not even discussing. Forget about all your all your money making schemes. Let's talk about the ones that you just go out there and do. So we'll, we'll, tell us about that one. Well, this is another one to come up. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I keep swearing I'm never going to do this again, and so I was at um, Real Scene, which is the television conference where you just pitch, 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 and you're so meeting every half hour for three days with another network, and you just pitch, 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 and I, I've sworn I'm never going to do another documentary film. I'm just going to produce series and and um, and not put myself into the situation, and while I was there, somebody said, so what's the one project you'd really like to do? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought about it for like 10 seconds, and, and the one popped into my mind was uh, another hero story of a, a guy who I found heroic. And um, his name's Evan Wolfson. And our families grew up together. And our parents are very close friends. And Evan has gone on to become the architect of the same-sex marriage movement, gay marriage. And, and, um, and he's just pushed this rock up the hill. It was like Sisyphus. It seemed impossible. He started out in the 80s. He wrote his um, thesis at Harvard Law in about same-sex marriage, and it was absurd. And, uh, and this June, 
it'll probably become the law of the land, constitutionally protected by the Supreme Court. And how he pulled that off and created a movement, it's like, wow. So I've been following Evan's life for a while, you know, just keeping an eye on him. You know, you'd be at the gym, you see him on like, you know, meet the press or something. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, our families are all so proud of him. And uh, so when somebody said, what film would you like to make? I, I just thought, I wonder what's going on with Evan. You know, who's making the film? So I, about three weeks ago, I contacted him right as I left Real Stream and I said, um, you know, I don't know if you know what I'm doing. You know, we've been in touch for 20 years, really, but um, you know, I'm a documentary filmmaker. And who's doing your movie? And he said, you are, and, which is the opposite of Sandhog, you know, where I had to go to work for months to gain their trust and get access. Or, or, you know, I have Evans, you know, our parents are friends, and, and uh, there's no way I could do anything injurious to him because my mother would kill me. And so he knows that. <laughs> And so he felt safe, and um, so I've been given access, exclusive access, to the um, march to the Supreme Court and to the history of the uh, Freedom to Marry movement from the guy who's spearheaded it. So I don't know so, if I caught this, but is Evan actually have? Does he have a Supreme Court case on the docket? He is not the attorney who will be arguing it in the Supreme Court. Um, the case is a complicated, multi. It's a bundled case of four cases that lost in, in various um, different districts. And so there, it's going to the Supreme Court together as a combined case, the case. And there are other attorneys who will be arguing the case in front of the Supreme Court. What Evan has done, he no longer does that. He, he, he did argue cases. He argued the first ones. He no longer is the attorney you know, who's quarterbacking the case. Because it turns out what he's learned through the course of the movement is that you can win in court, but if you lose in the court of public opinion, you can lose at the ballot box. You can make it so that you know the court rulings in state by state cases don't hold up. And so he realized that to win in court and to even get it to the Supreme Court before they'll take the case, they have to feel safe that America is ready for gay marriage to be legalized. And so he has abdicated the court cases to attorneys who he is in tight with and still is involved with the court cases. But he's run the campaign to make America comfortable with gay marriage. What and campaign so is that? It's called Freedom to Marry. He's got an organization, takes millions and millions of dollars. It's a grass, grassroots effort. They go state by state and they convince legislators that if they vote for this that they won't lose their jobs they go door to door and tell their stories and say this is who we are they've had pollsters that they redefine it from it's no longer about gay bashing or homophobia or sex at all it's about american values it's about the golden rule they've figured out the way to crack the code and they they managed to uh, make it into a civil rights movement that Americans could get behind and there therefore it's no longer just about passing judgment uh, about whether or not you're in favor of gay people and gay sex and gay marriage it's about whether or not you believe in America so how is your how is your process now because you, like you said you didn't have to wait six months to get access you've got it and yeah. now and <clears throat> look at you you're relaxing you're eating sandwiches drinking <laughs> yeah but I've been working like a dog you caught me this is why you haven't been able to get me on the phone <laughs> For so, two weeks, is I, I'm working nonstop because I have to shoot this film now. While I'm researching the film, while I'm raising the money, I don't have the money. I'm again dependent on friends to come and crew for me and donate their time, and hopefully, I'll be able to pay them. Um, you know, it's all. Well, I'll give you a day. How about that? You got it. Uh, <laughs> what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> Already? <laughs> You're calling the card this fast? <laughs> I am. I am, because I'm on my way to Texas. We're going to shoot this. We're going to shoot this film, and hopefully we'll figure out a way to pay for it, too. Are you actually, are you actually flying house. to Texas tomorrow? As what, soon as I can saying? organize. We're heading down to Texas, yeah. Okay, well, why don't you take me on that trip? If the price is right, Vitaly, let's go. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> it's a good one. 
This is a great yeah, story. You know, you came Very on my, you came story. on the podcast. What can I do? What can I do? Can I spend six months days. working let's for you? <laughs> can I? I need five days. Let's go. Because that's that, what's going on in Texas is great, and that's one third of the story. You know, the history of the movement from Stonewall and Evans' thesis in '83 till Supreme Court will pass us hopefully this uh, this spring. That's one strand of this, but the other strand is the legislative uh, the the um, the judicial battle is the Supreme Court case. So that's the second strand. And the third strand to weave together is the grassroots campaign to not just win in the court of law, but in the court of public opinion. And that they have to prove to the Supreme Court that America's ready. And the battleground for that right now is the South. It's the only place that the poll numbers aren't there, that they haven't won. Uh, gay marriage, is, same sex marriage is not legal. And, 13 states are on the South, are on the Bible Belt, and Texas is a big chunk of that. So they are organizing, and they're trying to prove to the Supreme Court that if they pass this, there will not be people on buildings shooting people and freaking out that it's safe. And as Ruth Ginsburg has said, the Supreme Court will not get ahead of all the people. So they work like dogs right now to prove that this is going to work, and the last place that they need to prove it is the South. So we'll, we'll show the South as one strand, the history is the other strand, and the summiting, you know, summiting the, the mountaintop with the Supreme Court case where hopefully they'll win this spring. Well, what's interesting, I mean, very interesting for people listening to the podcast that they're not interested in this particular issue is that how you're putting, how you're piecing this all together from basically nothing. And that's where I'm at now with the Freedom to Marry film is I'm understanding the issues as quickly as possible, talking on the phone, you know, hearing, hearing people's stories and casting it. And so that by the time I start to shoot, that's what I shoot because... I don't have like Joe Berlinger, you know, name your favorite filmmaker, the kind of financing from HBO to follow 100 characters or shoot, you know, 800 hours of film and come down to an hour and a half. You know, I don't have that, you know. Uh, what I shoot is what I'm going to use. I'm going to follow just certain people. I'm going to use that. Well, here's a question. Uh, you've done this enough times and you've sold your stuff enough times. Is I mean, don't people already know that you're good at telling stories? And isn't there a support base that you can go to to reach out to fund part of this? It's always a dogfight. Um, I'm not the big name that I would like to be to make these things easier. You know, you hear about other people who for finding funding is easier for them. I think one of the nice things would have been if I would have born rich and never needed funding. A lot of my favorite <laughs> filmmakers never needed funding, so they just made the films they wanted. Um, you know, I, I would like to uh, have it easier, and it's it's never easier, and so there it is. So I, I, I feel like, like the Freedom to Marry movement, one of the things I relate to, like I've just got to work with what I have and be a little smarter and uh, work a little harder. Cool. Well, uh, thanks for sharing, Eddie. And I did promise you guys I would do other things besides just a standard interview podcast, and that is happening. But uh, first, I got like a whole backlog of interviews I did with a bunch of folks. So those are going to be released in the next couple of weeks while I work on the other stuff. And, um, you know, enjoy. And uh, next week, we have a brand new director that we're going to discuss uh, his boxing movie with. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>